name is Richard Heinberg. I've written uh, three books on the subject of peak oil, and I teach uh, at a small private college in Northern California called New College of California. <laughs> Well, peak oil is just the observation of the fact that uh, in any given oil reservoir, uh, production increases to a certain point, then re reaches a maximum and starts to decline. We've seen that in oil fields for decades uh, all around the world, and now we've seen a number of important oil-producing nations reach their peak and go into decline, including the U.S. and Great Britain and Norway and Oman, Mexico. The list goes on quite a while. It's actually most oil-producing countries. And so every year there are fewer oil-producing countries in the category of oil exporters and more countries in the category of oil importers. So at some point, probably in the very near future, global oil production is going to reach its maximum and start to go south. And that's going to have enormous economic geopolitical implications because the whole world is right now utterly dependent on oil for transportation, for agriculture, for plastics and chemicals. So peak oil is um, one of the great challenges of, of the coming century and probably of, of, of the coming decade. For the last 150 years, every day we've had more oil available. We went from zero production in 1859, the beginning of the oil industry, to 84 million barrels of oil per day, which is what the world currently consumes. And that oil has enabled uh, the Industrial Revolution, essentially. More transportation, more manufacturing, more invention, more moving of goods. So having less oil to deal with means no more economic growth. It means an enormous challenge to the kind of world that we've created, where we rely on these services increasing as population is still growing. So peak oil means really economic catastrophe for the entire world. We've never had anything before like oil. We've been using energy as long as we've been human, mostly through the, the food we eat, and then we've found other ways of harvesting energy from the environment, water mills and windmills and so on. But all of those sources of energy were minuscule compared to oil, which is very, a very concentrated source of energy. Maybe you've had the experience of running out of, of petrol in your car and having to push it off to the side of the road. You know that's hard work. Well, now imagine having to push your car 20 or 30 miles. That's the energy equivalent of something like six to eight weeks of hard human labor. And we get that for just uh, currently where I live in California, $2.50. You can't get work done that cheaply even in China. Uh, six to eight weeks of human labor for that amount of money so, of course, we've, uh, we've mechanized everything we possibly can over the past hundred years. Everything that involves um, labor, output of, of energy into the environment, we've, we've mechanized. And so we've become completely dependent on our fuel-fed machines to do all the work for us that's required to maintain our industrial way of life. <laughs> America is the, the quintessential uh, oil-dependent culture. There are virtually no options for transportation other than cars and buses and, and trucks. And American communities mostly have been designed since the, the beginning of the automobile age, so it's really hard to get around American towns and cities without a car. So in fact, these days, there are actually more cars in the U.S. than there are licensed drivers. Uh, everything about the U.S., uh, the, the parking lots, the, the, the way roads are constructed, everything is built on the assumption that everybody is going to have a personal car. And that only makes sense as long as we have cheap fuel. Think about how unique oil is in terms of its, its chemistry, its energy density, and so on. 
to think that what we're doing with it is simply pulling it out of the ground and burning it as fast as we possibly can seems utterly outrageous. This is the most in, unintelligent thing we could possibly do with this amazing stuff. I mean, possibly future generations will be able to think of interesting things to do with this stuff, but they probably won't have the chance because there won't be any left. Uh, now, uh, you could call this diachronic competition. In other words, we who are alive today are in competition not with other species so much as with our own descendants. We are actively reducing the survival opportunities of our own children and grandchildren. There's never been anything quite like this before in human history. One gauge of our success as a species using fossil fuels is the fact that there are now so many of us. When we first started using fossil fuels, there were fewer than a billion human beings alive. We achieved one billion right around 1820, early in the Industrial Revolution. We got up to two billion around 1930, three billion in the 1960s, four billion in the 70s, five billion in the late 1980s, we got up to 6 billion humans by 1999, and we've added more than a half billion more humans just since the turn of the 21st century. So if you looked at, at that purely from a biological perspective, that's an enormous success for one species. But it's a very perilous kind of success because it's all based on the consumption of fossil fuels. Take away the fossil fuels, and what's the human carrying capacity of planet Earth? Well, no one knows exactly, but a good guess would be something like what it was when we first started using fossil fuels, which is close to a billion. As the availability of fossil fuels starts to decline, it'll probably be possible, theoretically, for us to continue supporting the number of people we have if we're very careful and very intelligent in how we grow food. We're going to have to relocalize food production. We're going to have to use very labor-intensive and intelligent means of growing food, systems like permaculture and biointensive gardening. But if we, if we don't do that, if we don't act proactively to break up the, the huge industrial farms and, and teach people how to grow their own food and start encouraging uh, urban gardening and things like that, the result is going to be massive starvation because we simply won't be able to support the population that we have now without fossil fuels. So this, this means basically a reversal of the trend that existed throughout the 20th century. During the 20th century, the trend was urbanization. People were moving off of farms into cities because they couldn't compete with the fuel-fed uh, farm machinery. Now, in the 21st century, we're going to have to move people off of, out of cities and back onto farms. It's going to be a, a trend of re-ruralization. If we don't do that, there's simply no way that um, a few million people working on the farm are going to be able to support enormous numbers of people living in cities. There won't be any way to transport the food to them. So this is, uh, this is probably the greatest demographic challenge the human race has ever faced. As, as oil production peaks, we'll see uh, economies begin to come apart at the seams. Uh, nations may begin to fight over the world's remaining oil supplies. We'll see increasing competition between oil importing nations. We'll also see increasing unrest within uh, oil nations as, as different social factions vie for control of this increasingly va valuable resource. We'll see uh, farmers going bankrupt as they are unable to pay for fuel for their tractors. As a result of that, food prices will, will skyrocket and we'll see increasing levels of, of hunger. As economies uh, collapse, then people will begin to default on their loans and mortgages. We'll see uh, enormous increase in homelessness.
In other words, we're talking about a situation somewhat similar to the Great Depression of the 1930s, only in this case probably far worse because during the 1930s most people still lived rurally. Most people still produced at least some of their own necessities. Now today we're so much more dependent on stores, long distance transportation, uh, large scale manufacturing, that as this system begins to fail, we'll have very little else to, uh, to, to rely on. Looking at the colliding effects of, of peak oil and global climate change, it would seem that we are facing something like a collapse of industrial civilization. Of course, it wouldn't be the first time that a human civilization has collapsed. There have been something like 24 civilizations in the past, and, and most of them have come apart because of resource depletion or habitat destruction. In our case, it's, uh, it's likely to be much worse because, of course, what we have today is a global civilization. When's it going to happen? Um, I, I think a, a, a good rough estimate would be sometime around the, the, the middle decades of, of the century. We humans like to pride ourselves on our intelligence, and of course, you know, here we are able to make computers and, and uh, video cameras and all kinds of complex technologies, wonderful stuff. But really, nature only cares about one kind of intelligence, and that's the intelligence that would enable us to look at what we're doing and the likely consequences of our actions, to be able to judge which consequences are detrimental to our own survival prospects, and then change our behavior accordingly. If we can do that, then I think nature will judge us as being an intelligent species. If we can't, then I don't think we have right to think of ourselves as being any more intelligent than, than yeast which would be acting exactly the same way. If we put them in a, a bottle of, of grape juice, they'd be, they'd be eating up the sugar in the grape juice, consuming their energy source, and at the same time they'd be giving off an, uh, a waste product, namely alcohol, and, which would be poisoning them. And uh, so their, their numbers would proliferate until they ate up their energy sources and poisoned themselves with their waste product, and then they'd have a, a die-off. We're doing exactly the same thing with fossil fuels. We're eating up our energy source as fast as we can, and we're polluting the environment with the waste product. So are we smarter than yeast? That's the question. We'll find out. My name is Richard Heinberg. I've written uh, three books on the subject of peak oil, and I teach uh, at a small private college in Northern California called New College of California. <music> and go into decline, including the U.S. and Great Britain and Norway and Oman, Mexico. The list goes on quite a while. It's actually most oil-producing countries. And so every year there are fewer oil-producing countries in the category of oil exporters and more countries in the category of oil importers. So at some point, probably in the very near future, global oil Well, peak oil is just the observation of the fact that uh, in any given oil reservoir, uh, production increases to a certain point, then re reaches a maximum and starts to decline. We've seen that in oil fields 
for decades uh, all around the world. And now we've seen a number of important oil producing nations reach their peak. Oil production is going to reach its maximum and start to go south. And that's going to have enormous economic geopolitical implications because the whole world is right now utterly dependent on oil for transportation, for agriculture, for plastics and chemicals. So peak oil is um, one of the great challenges of, of the coming century and probably of, of, of the coming decade.